It's just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Daniel Ultzberger, Feldman, DDS, DMD. He has been granted with several awards on his proprietary low-dose dynamic radiography pioneering neo-imaging breakthrough. In 2014, this concept received the medical device and diagnostic industry Dare to Design Reader's Choice Award at the MedTech Design Challenge. He is a 2013 William H. Rollins Award recipient established by the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology to recognize an individual with an outstanding body of research in the field of dental radiology. By the first time in dental history, his other research area of expertise has showed evidence of the cervical plexus nerve implication in dental anesthesia failures and cardiac jaw pain, which leads to the development of an improved intraoral cervical plexus anesthetic technique. These efforts have guided to the accessory innervation theory substantiation in dental anesthesia. Dr. Ertzberger has... Feldman has been a receiver of three prestigious dental medical journals, Clinical Anatomy, JADA, and JDR. He received his odont odontologist dental degree, DDS equivalent, from Central University of Venezuela in 95, and his postgraduate certificate in endodontics from Carlos J. Bello Hospital in 97. His private practice in Venezuela, where he worked from 95 to 2003, was limited to endodontics. During those years, he practiced at the Miss Venezuela Organization Affiliated Dental Office, among other prestigious practices in Caracas. He obtained the honorific mention award, Pedro Henriquez, for best research in the Venezuelan Society Endodontics 95 and 97. Dr. Olsberger worked two years as clinical instructor in the undergraduate program of the Department of Endodontics at Central University of Venezuela, and five years as a professor of endodontics in the postgraduate program of the Venezuelan Red Cross. He was the secretary of the Commission of the National Meeting and International Symposium in 2001 and also assisted as the AAOMR Strategic Planning Committee 2009 to 2016. Since 2003, he has been teaching and researching in the Department of Endontology at Temple University Kornberg School of Dentistry um, in Boston, right? In Philly. In, in Philadelphia, sorry about that, where he earned his DMD certificate in 2006. At TUKSOD, he is former director of the current literature review course, postgraduate endodontology program, former co-director of the advanced rotary endo course, and former co-director of the clinical endodontology course, third year pre-doctoral students, currently is involved with research activities in the low-dose dental imaging, accessory innervation in dental anesthesia, and endodontic obturation materials field. With 22 years of experience, he worked five years at the private practice in Philadelphia, and now he serves patients in Cleveland, Ohio suburbs. My God, I think you might be the smartest person that ever came on the show. Thanks. I can always tell because your brain gets so big, all the hair follicles are squeezed out, <laughs> and you just end up with a beautiful bald head. If you're on iTunes, his bald head is actually better looking than mine. So uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's just that uh, the only reason this show is a success because I'm able to get people like you to give my homies an hour of your time. Um, I don't even know where to start with you. I mean, my gosh. Um, first of all, I want to start with the uh, radi is radiation exposure the new tobacco because when you go, like right now at the um, Washington, D.C., this is the last day of the AEO meeting. The American Association of Orthodontics meeting has been going Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and today's last day, Monday. And people selling CBCTs are saying every child should have a CBCT. And then you got radiologists, they're just like cringing, like, really? And, uh, and then now there's people saying that when you do a molar endo, that standard of care would be taking a CBCT of this molar to see if it makes sure you got all the canals and all this. So is, is um, and, and then it's, the public is even more confused. The patients are confused because look, look at the patients. They're, they're reading equal amounts of research to say, you should go out and get 10 minutes of sun a day so that you get 30 to 40,000 units of vitamin D3. And then the dermatologist say, no, 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 you put sunscreen all over yourself and you never let yourself see the sun. So what is it? Should we get 10 minutes of sun or should we put on sunscreen every morning? And should we, is a PA good enough for a molar root canal or do we need a CBCT every molar before we start working on it? Well, regarding to the sun, uh, I don't have expertise in that area, but <laughs> regarding to the radiation, I can tell you the following. 
let's say that you are a six years old right now and you're playing soccer and you bump your head with another kid. The first thing that your mom will do is to take you to the clinic and then they will take your first CT scan. Then you are nine years old and then you have like a low abdomen pain. Your mom takes you to the clinic and then they do your second CBCT, CT scan. Then you bump your tooth, you are nine years old. Bump your tooth, play soccer, take you to the endodontist, your third CBCT scan. Then you're 12 and you need braces. Your mom takes you to the orthodontist. What's the first thing they will do there? Your fourth CBCT scan. And finally, you are around 16 and you need wisdom teeth extraction. Your mom takes you to the oral surgeon. There you get your fifth CBCT scan. And did you know that if you get five CT scans when you are during your childhood, your cancer risk increases considerably? So practically, you will have 30, 40 years old. You never smoke. You ate organic all your life. You were a vegetarian. You don't have any person in your family with a, a previous history of cancer, but then you will develop thyroid, brain, or salivary gland cancer. And where is this coming from? This is coming from all these CBCT scans that you got during your childhood. So this is why I am saying that radiation exposure is the new tobacco. I will tell you something. At least if you smoke, you enjoy it. If you get this scan, you don't enjoy anything. So this is why I urge to the development of a solution for this problem. I believe that the CT scan as an invention is great. I believe that when we need it, we should use it. But I also believe that we should reduce the radiation dosage to which we have been uh, exposed. And the good news is that there is a promising technology that will do that. We call it neoimaging. And neoimaging is the largest radiation dose reduction since the X-rays discovery in 1895. What we did is we use, I am sure that you are familiar with the cell phones and the new cameras. These new, you know, iPhones and Samsungs, they can practically see in the dark and they can take a very good a, a low light uh, pictures and videos. We're practically converting the sensor from this kind of uh, cameras and cell phones into an X-ray detector. And then if we do this, we can considerably reduce the radiation power at the X-ray source and we can capture the images. So we did this proof of the uh, concept in 2013 and 2015 and we were able to not only reduce the radiation dosage, but also to uh, minimize the pixel size for an improved uh, image resolution. So I am talking about getting X-rays into the 8K, like the new TVs, the new flat panel TVs. That will be a resolution of the X-ray that we will take on you in the future. So we call this a, a concept Neo Imaging because this will be the new way to take x-rays. And currently we are translating this a concept from the dental a, a you know arena because it started there to the medical setting. And we are planning to develop a flat panel detectors for a all a medical and dental imaging modalities including CT scan. Wow, that is amazing. Um it's funny how history repeats itself because when um William um Conrad Rentkin um, invented the x-rays, as you said, in 1895. Um, do, you, do you remember how he died? Yes, he died. All of them, they died due to overdose. Suicide. He was in uh, so really? much pain, he blew his head off. And, right, but and, all of them, they died because they got cancer because of all, you know, all the radiation they got. Yeah, he kept taking x-rays of his hand, and he actually got hand cancer. And then, the, and then, the, um, and then, was, I think it was like 14 months after he um, uh, was taking X-rays of his hand, this other guy started taking X-rays of his teeth, and he was holding the plate in his mouth. And uh, that guy, I mean, there, I mean, so many people died. And now I, I was reading the the some of the facts that you sent me. I want to just read this. Um, 
Worldwide estimates indicate that 3.1 billion diagnostic radiographic, half billion dentals, and 37 million nuclear medicine examinations are performed annually. Globally, the average annual per capita of effective dose from radiographs has approximately doubled in the past 10 to 15 years. CT scanning accounts for almost half of the collective effective dose for medical procedures in the United States, but only about 17% of the total number of procedures performed. Publications in medical imaging have suggested that as many as 20 to 50% of high-tech imaging procedures fail to provide information that improves patient welfare. Current dental digital x-ray image technologies allow detecting decay after 40% of the enamel has been affected due to their um, less than 19 UM pixel size. A smaller pixel size would have a positive impact in early stage fractures, identification, incipient lesions, and caries detection. Um, I mean, and I, I was so upset. My boy had a little bump, my youngest, of course. I mean, he was um, this couple of years ago, I think he was 20. And he had a bump, and I could tell it was really concerning him. And I thought, well, let's just run down uh, to the, the, the emergency room, and we'll just go through triage because I know this is really scaring you. So they took him back there. I mean, the lady was a nurse. First thing she did is took a CT. When the doctor got there, he looked at her. He chewed her out in front of me. He goes, what the hell did you do that for? You can't take this without me. And, right. um, and so that was his whole scrotum testicle area because oh, it, was, wow. it, was, it was halfway between his belly button and his scrotum. He goes, that's just a little fat right. bump. That is nothing. And I thought, you just irradiated his testicles, and you're not even a doctor. And right. you know why they did it? Because when I got the final bill, you know how much that little, that little picture cost? $8,000. No. Wow. And you no know, insurance. Well, yeah, well, that's what the insurance had to pay. It was not, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, yeah, right. insurance, but I mean, but it's like, you know that's the only reason they took it, because they could bill eight grand. Well, also because of a uh, defensive medicine. Yeah. What if they don't take it, and then this bomb starts growing, and it's a, hopefully not, but it's a malignant lesion, and then they get, you know, a legal problem because of that. So, I will not blame the doctors, the uh, medical physicists, the radiologists, uh, you know, it's very hard to blame someone uh, because of this situation. And also the dentist, the dentist taking these CT scans, what if you don't take it? That's a problem. But uh, thank God we are working on solutions for a problem and hopefully in the next future uh, this problem will be solved. Well, where could my homies read about what you were talking about with the smartphone? Where, where, where could they read or learn about that? Uh, we have a website. Uh, it is www.neoimagingtech.com. Neoimagingtech.com. So right. And what, are, what is everyone going to find when they go to that website? That, believe it or not, they, since we don't have any product yet and we are not selling anything, they will uh, just find our ideas, our concepts, and this is something that they, if they like uh, new things and uh, things for the future, they will enjoy it. But there is nothing else. It's just the uh, concept because uh, currently we are uh, yeah, may, working on uh, raising funding in order to move forward towards uh, yeah, the market. So it says uh, on the website, neoimagingtech.com, you write, the light bulb went off for co-founder Daniel Ultzberger Feldman when he was performing a challenging dental procedure to retrieve bypass a separated instrument fragment left on a patient's molar tooth during a root canal. Still remembers his frustration, more importantly, the patient's suffering. After three unsuccessful attempts and more than one hour each to retrieve the fragment, since necessity is the mother invention, he tried to find an alternative way to visualize these procedures during procedures instead of before and after due to the limitations of existing x-ray imaging technologies. Man, that's going to be so cool. So, um, so how far along is this project? We have the pr proof of concept done. We have all the proposals for developing it from the engineers and we just need to get the money and get it done so how can my homies help you find the money what, what do you need you need connections <laughs> venture capitalists you need yes uh, all what you can if you have the uh, these connections we appreciate the uh, you know your uh, well, well, help send me send me the proposals because i know everybody in dentistry who's a billionaire and a hundred millionaire and uh s send uh, you and your uh 
your buddy CEO, uh, Michael Schinsheimer, MHA, MBA. Um, yeah, s send me the whole proposal, then I'll forward it uh, to the big boys, like Rick Workman, who owns Heartland, um, um, you know, the um, Steve Thorne, who owns Pacific Dental. Um, you know, um, there, there's a lot of people that just are so passionate about dentistry. Awesome. Yeah. Wendell. So, so what else has got you, um, you passionate? Well, in addition to a, uh, the uh, radiation situation, there is another problem that I see in the industry, we, which is the fact of that we have been working blindly during all these years because we can only take x-rays prior or after the procedure. But during the procedure, we don't see what we are doing. We have been doing guesswork during all this time. So what if we could have like a video x-ray that allow you to see where or when the file is going up to the working lane or the good aperture or your rotary system, or what if you can see the implant placement while placing it in real time. But I'm not talking about a, um, a seating the patient, taking a mold, preparing like a tray, then sending the patient out or taking a CBCT scan in your office and then sending all this information to a navigation company, then waiting a couple of weeks to get the navigation path and then using a virtual navigation path for placing it. I am talking about, you see the patient, you show a video from the last patient, you work out showing how you put the implant, open your mouth, you put the implant, you see everything and that's it, five minutes. And the radiation that the patient will get in that implant placement is much lower than the CBCT scan. So this is what I am talking about. This is a, uh, the other area which uh, I am uh, passionate about, which is uh, dynamic imaging. And this can be done thanks to neoimaging because radiation is so low that we just need to add 30 frames per second and you get video. In addition to this dynamic uh, uh, radiography, there is another problem with the current devices because uh, we currently have a 10% of retakes, which means that when we are taking an X-ray, we can have a concut overlapping shortening or elongation. This happens because we can't aim before we take the x-ray, but what if you could aim like a cell phone or a digital camera, then you say cheese and as soon as you like it, you take it. So this technology will allow doing that. So we'll take the x-ray just once, not repeating x-rays anymore. And how, how far along is that, is that project? It is the same situation. We have a uh, three projects within the AMA, uh, our proposed developments, and this is one of them. And where does all this come from? T talk about your journey. First, first of all, do you mind me asking how old you are? A uh, forty-eight. Forty-eight. So, wh when did you first start it? When when did you first have decided you wanted to be the next William Rankin? <laughs> When I was 29, the day when uh, when that happens, I was doing this root canal in Venezuela, and then I was struggling because we can't see what we are doing, trying to bypass or retrieve this separated instrument. Back then, I used to work in a very large office uh, with physicians, and that morning, the ophthalmologist, her patient, didn't show up, so she came to my you know to my chair to say hi and to see what I was doing. I was explaining her my frustration. And then she say, but how come that you, you are struggling like this? If you could have fluoroscopy, you could see everything. And you won't have any problems for doing your root canals. Then I ask, what, what is this fluoroscopy? Then I start searching what fluoroscopy was. And then this is how, as soon as I figure out, I start working on this. And I have been working on this for since 1999, practically. 1999? Nice yes. Did, did Prince's song have anything to do with this? Party like it's 1999? <laughs> I think it would. Yep, it did. <laughs> <laughs> My gosh. Um, you know, they always say the best ideas are the um, mother of necessity, you know? Exactly. And uh, if, if all you're trying to do is solve your own problem and you really care about your customer, I mean, if you work hard, you really care, and you're trying to build a business to solve a problem that you have, I mean, that, that's the three ingredients to just doing it. 
Yep. So, uh, so it is. So are you pretty optimistic that you'll get funding and, and I think so. Pull this I don't up? see one reason for not getting it. Yeah. Um, so what's what else are you passionate about? Well, the third thing, which is actually what I am uh, talking about in the present moment, is uh, dental anesthesia. And uh, it seems that finally, after over 100 years of failures to describing why we can't get numb the posterior mandibular teeth, finally it seems that we have found a, a very simple explanation for that. The name of the explanation is uh, accessory innervation. So I always say, if there is a fight in between neoimaging, the dental dynamic, a uh, innovation that I uh, described you before, and the accessory inner innervation, who wins? I think the accessory innervation a concept will beat the other two. Why? Because this one doesn't need any money, doesn't need any development. It is just ready to go. So I just published a, a, in your a, a Dental Town a magazine a, 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 at the um, a April issue, a, our anesthetic, a, a, a accessory innovation anesthetic protocol. And we have, been, we have received a very good uh, feedback uh, regarding to it. So currently I am working in the video presentation, which is very cool because there I show how we discover the nerve. We are talking about the discovery of a nerve coming from the neck and entering the mandible by first time in dental history. It was an um, amazing article. It's called Accessory Innervation Anesthetic Protocol from Research Theory to Clinical Clinical Reality by Daniel Uzbuger Feldman. I'm sorry, I, I uh, am so bad with other languages. Uh, the only right. the only D I'm embarrassed to tell you this. The only D I ever got in my life was in high school Spanish, and Dr. San Martin told my mother that I was linguistically retarded. And <laughs> then at the same time, my piano teacher, after an hour, I mean, she's making money off these lessons for me and my five sisters, and I'm the only one she fired. She told my mom how we oh, wow. couldn't carry a tune in a lunch pail. So I'm <laughs> sorry if every time I say your name, it sounds different than the time before. But th this That's article right. was, uh, was just amazing. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you, one of the guys that replied to your article was um, um, Tuttle Numb Now. Uh, with his local um, anesthetic. I was wondering, were you familiar with his anesthetic technique? Do you think there's any merit not, to that? or uh, Not before. I, I'm happy that he, uh, you know, uh, replied, replied to the, um, uh, through the comments because, you know, it uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, see what he's doing, and I believe it is great because what he's doing is uh, uh, improving the intraosseous technique and as you know the uh, main advantage of the intraosseous technique is that it gets numb all these accessory nerve nerves that i am talking about in one shot so it is pretty remarkable very, very nice and that's what i like about dental town magazine is that um you know when you if you read a newspaper or you read a magazine and you have a question i mean that that one way media i used to do that i had a magazine called the fran report from 94 to 98 where i just mailed it to you it was from me to you so it was the fran report and all, and the and all the information was what i was learning when i was lecturing every weekend you know you'd be having breakfast lunch and dinner with your homies and um and you would wrap that up in a magazine but to god when i saw them talking on ESPN message boards about soccer and football. And by the way, you're, you're from both uh, hemispheres of America. You're from the north and the south. And the south football is soccer. And in the north, soccer, football yes. is uh, the other kind. Uh, which, which football do you prefer the most? Well, I, since I came originally to Philadelphia, I am a super fan of sports and uh, competition and, uh, you know, so uh, I fall in love with the American football, but as you know, uh, in my southern hemisphere, we love soccer. So I, I like both. Uh, you know, football is the number one sport in this country. Soccer is the number one sport worldwide. I am looking forward for the World Cup right now, and I am looking forward for the Cleveland Browns to improve. Um, you, soccer will be the number one sport for the next century because it's the lowest cost sport. Right. Um, and you're not going to have ice hockey 
in Africa and Asia or, yes, and uh, or baseball. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so it, it you know it's 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 cost. I mean, every business has got to be faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, and then it ends up being miniaturized, which is number five. I mean, right. the iPhone I'm holding in my hand has the power of a IBM mainframe computer when I was in high school, and so yep. everything gets faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, and more miniature. People oftentimes forget that number five. Like when I bought my first intro camera. It was the size of a refrigerator. It's called Fuji Cam. Right. And it was $38,000. And wow. I, I could not pick it up myself. I mean, it, they put it on <laughs> wheels. And now you right. got these little things and, and the new oral scanners from uh, um, um, Copenhagen, Denmark. What is it? Uh, uh, Trios? Trios? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the miniature race is wonderful. But yeah, soccer is amazing. And what's amazing is. Um, Football is getting all the attention and movies made about their concussions, but soccer, oh, wow. soccer, it's actually could be um, just as bad or worse because what the pros have figured out is that if you have a Sunday game and you get your brain banged up, that if you don't do anything for the next 48 hours, it heals up right. pretty rapidly. The problem with soccer is these boys and girls are playing it every single day at recess, lunch, after school, and every day they're banging this head. They do. And having two older sisters that are Catholic nuns, I know there's no way I could convince them to be Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists. And if you tried to go back to Central and South America, Africa and Asia, and say, hey, let's quit using our head and use our hands, what do you think the chance of that going through would be? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. So, right. so then the next step is you got to tell the kids that when you're playing soccer, you can only use your head two days a week. Right. <laughs> because that would significantly reduce um, the, the damage. I mean, there's, there's been I – mean, I've read so many papers on it. So my question to you is, are, are you going to let your kids play soccer? They do, but do you – do you uh, remember when I started talking about this radiation problem? I didn't mention bumping your head playing football. I mentioned soccer. It's because that's a big concern. Nevertheless, my one of my kids, he likes soccer, and he's seven years old now. And you know, we are trying out. I am there watching. So, I guess if there is any issue, I'll be there. So um, the coach is there, and everybody's there. And well, you know the. Um the, the most pro reason for a union I've seen is that the professional football players in America, they actually threatened to go on strike if they didn't have helmetless, um, padless workouts uh, two or three days during the week. They only wanted full contact on game day and one practice day. But, huh. the, but the college football, because they had the research, so they had all the neurologists in there saying they right. need 48 hours of healing, and that significantly reduced it. But the colleges in America, they don't have a union, and, those, and usually the college football coach, I think, is the highest paid state employee in like 36 of the 50 states. So all they want to do is win. So those poor right. kids are in full helmet and contact, banging each other's head all day, every day, for the whole season, and it's like, okay, well, there's a perfectly good reason of checks and balances of why workers should have unions. So you right. also um, you also talk about dental anxiety. Yes, because that's part of the a uh, problem here with the dental anesthetic failure. Because patients they are terrified to go to the dentist because they believe that they are not going to be totally numb. And patients, they don't like to start jumping in the chair and, you know, holding hands. So if I were a patient and I go to the dentist for a, you know, a feeling on my back molar and the dentist can't get me home, I, I, I'm not coming back. It's that simple. And that happens on a daily basis. I'm not even saying for root canals or uh, extraction, for feelings. So patients, when they come to me for uh, root canals, they are terrified from my uh, previous experiences. And we're in 2018, uh, you know, Cleveland, Philadelphia. These are, uh, you know, major cities with dental schools in the cities. So there is no reason in my mind for this to happen over and over again. This is how, why it is so important uh, yeah, for, uh, you know, uh, dentists and dental schools to start promoting uh, this uh, uh, accessory innervation 
a, as the reason for failures and make sure that the new dentists and the you know the young generations will start getting on all the nerves prior starting doing a, a filling on the tooth. How they are getting on all the nerves with the you know that's their decision. They can do the protocol that I propose, which is uh, free. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to pay for anything. You just use your syringe. You just use a yeah, blue needle, a yellow needle, and then you get on the lingual nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, that you know how to do it. You get on the mylohyoid, you know how to do that. You get on the buccal, then you get on the cervical plexus, that's, that's a new nerve we discover. At the Dental Town magazine, you can uh, read how this technique is uh, um, uh, administered, which is practically a um, uh, infiltration below the tooth you want to get numb. And after that, believe it or not, you should do the mental nerve. Because if you don't do the mental nerve, the patient may feel your work. So after doing all this together, the tooth should be numb, the patient should be numb, and no more jumping in the, in the dental chair, no more holding hands in the dental chair, no more anxiety, no more problems. That is amazing, man. You got enough work on your plate. If you're 48, you're going to have to live to be at least 88. And then by then, you'll have five more projects. <laughs> yeah, we never know. I think it's uh, like a yep, so, never-ending story. So your dental school, which is now, um, you, know, you know, I'm old school. It used to be University of Philly, but now it's the... Um, Oh, gosh. The, it's a Temple, it? Temple University. Uh, Temple, yeah, it used to be called Temple University. And, uh, now it's called Kornberg School. Kornberg. Kornberg School of Dentistry. Do you know what right. the yearly tuition is now there? No, I am not familiar that, with that. Is that right that's now. a private school. Is that a state school? or? It is, a, it is a half and half. It's half half, and a half private, yes, half state. Yeah, but, you know, um, I, I want to switch to Molar Endo because you're an endodontist. Um, the, these kids come out of school. You know, a lot of these schools – are now seventy to a hundred thousand dollars a year, so just as little as five years ago, it seemed like anybody I was talking to was about three hundred thousand in debt, and just yes. a blink of an eye, it's four hundred thousand dollars in debt. Wow! And you know, it takes a lot of uh, personality to sell bleaching, bonding, veneers, big cases, and they don't even have the skills for these full mouth cases. You know, they're they're still trying to learn how to do a filling, a crown, basic right. endo, and Root canals is something you don't have to sell. They're coming into you, and they're in pain. And the public health people keep screaming that 8.5% of all emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin. And a lot of that's because um, the dentist's office is closed, or they, um, they, they went to a dentist. They said, well, here's a referral to an endodontist, and the endodontist can't get him in for five days, and now it's right. 2 o'clock in the morning. So. So they need to learn how to do molar endo, but they always come out of school and they say, Howard, I hate it. I hate it. Um, what advice would you tell? 25% of our listeners are still in dental school. The rest are pretty much under 30. Please send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com, and tell me how old you are, what country you're from. Um, and um, what would you tell a kid? Because I'm telling them, to, you know, there's nine specialties. And they always talk about your especially endo and perio and pedo and orthodontics, but they never talk about public health. And gosh darn it, when someone walks in your office and they're in pain, I, and I, the, most, the people who make the most money are the oral surgeons because they know how to pull the tooth, the endodontists because they know how to do a root canal. They're coming in, they're, they're, they're looking for you. You're not having to send them a flyer in the mail and all your advertising doesn't work because it doesn't target them when they have a toothache. There's no targeting involved. It's like watching cable television. You know, there's no right. targeting involved. You're sitting there next to your five-year-old granddaughter watching a Cialis commercial. I mean, you know, just it's, it's, it's insane. What would you tell these kids in dental school who already have this mental block and they say, Dan, I hate, I hate endo. Well, believe it or not, one of the main reasons for hating endo is difficulty for getting on the patients. It is frustrating as a dentist when you have a lower molar and you are ready to start, but the patient is having pain, it is not numb, then you do six, seven, eight carpools and then it doesn't get numb and then you have to put uh, temporary filling and send the patient out, give antibiotics or anything. 
you know, thinking that this is happening because of the inflammation or that there is pus coming out, and you know, it is frustrating. So I do believe that if the new graduates or if the dental students uh, focus on this accessory innervation technique or uh, the, the uh, understand the anatomy of the oral cavity and uh, figure out how to get numb all these nerves, they will tackle one of the main problems of doing molar endo, which is getting numb. So for years we uh, have heard that the, one of the main objectives in endodontics is the cleaning and shaping of the root canal system. One of the main objectives in endodontics is the uh, disinfection, irrigation, or obturation, but in my opinion, one of the main objectives in endodontics is to get numb the patient. And if you get numb, because this is the first step, this is your introduction card, this is how you're saying to the patient, hey, I am Dr. Isbelger Feldman, nice meeting you. When you get them numb, you cannot imagine how happy, uh, you know, all the things, the beautiful things that the patient tell me on a daily basis each time that I work on them. Just because I get them numb, it is incredible. So this is what I, you know, recommend to the uh, new graduates to focus on getting numb the patients really well and then they will see how they li their life will change in the dental practice. They will have a super relaxing, they will, they will want to go to the dental practice, you know, get numb the patients and say, hello, dental pulp, which is what <laughs> I have been, what I have been uh, promoting during all these years. Yeah, when you come out with it, your advertisement should be the Scarface say, scene. You should say, say hello to my little friend. And you should be <laughs> holding his friends. That would be so there you nice. I, I am the uh, presentation that I'm working uh, right now for Dental Town. This is the first slide. It's just that. So you, hey, are, you have Scarface? A, not Scarface, but uh, you, what you just say, uh, like you, a video you, you of should, a you, very nice pulp that I you removed. You should Photoshop your like face. Like in slow motion. So <laughs> you, it's really cool. You should Photoshop your face over Al, uh, what was his name? Who's that guy? In, uh, Al Pacino. Al, Al Pacino. Pacino. I said Al Capone. That's how dumb I am. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then take out the machine gun and put a, a syringe in his hand. That would be so hilarious. Right. And, and that, you know, um, you know, they've always told us for a thousand years, it, you know, you, you, it takes your whole life to build your reputation and you can root it in five minutes. I mean, they'll still only remember Bill Clinton for Monica Lewinsky or Kennedy for Marilyn Monroe. Septicane got a really bad rap decades ago and it still just keeps lingering on. I, I'm still amazed that I feel 10 years after this has been put to rest, you still have all these kids ask you, well, do you think I should just use lidocaine because septicaine might increase paresthesia? Do, do you still hear that question, and how would you answer it? Yes. Uh, when I talk about the anesthetic protocol uh, for accessory innervation, I recommend to use articaine, which is the septocaine, only for the cervical plexus uh, technique or for the cervical plexus uh, infiltration. Why? Because the cervical plexus is a very thin nerve. It's thinner than a hair of my hair, and I am bald. <laughs> so you will never cause a paresthesia of the cervical plexus in this level. For the rest of the injections, I recommend using lidocaine or uh, mepivacaine if the patient has, you know, uh, cardiovascular issues or cannot get the uh, epinephrine. So for the upper maxilla. I do recommend to use septocaine for all the injections. There are very only very few reports of uh, paresthesia in the upper maxilla as compared to the mandible. And as you know, the a, a most common uh, nerve getting paresthesia is the lingual nerve. So I do not recommend uh, doing uh, using this kind of anesthetic for the lingual or the inferior alveolar. Nevertheless, a, a, my, a, you know, there is a very famous doctor who is the doctor writing the books. Uh, I, I really admire him because, you know, all the work and trajectory that he has is Dr. Malamed. Uh, he, uh, he recommends to use septocaine for, you know, any technique that you want. So just to let you know, because, you know, it's good for the new graduates to listen to all the opinions. My humble opinion is 
to use it only for the plexus technique and for the uh, upper maxilla, but to use it with no, uh, you know, no concern, no hesitation. Following Dr. Malamed, he recommends to use it for the IN nerve and for everything. So uh, it is up to the, you know, the young, uh, our young peers to put it in a balance and do whatever, whatever they believe is the best. In my experience, I have never had one case of paresthesia. And I do lots of shots because I do the whole protocol in my patients. So I believe that my protocol is really safe and very reliable. So if they are really concerned about paresthesia, use my protocol as I am saying, and you will get numb. all the patients, you know, in a very high percentage of times. And you can even do it with mepivacaine and do a molar root canal in a patient with irreversible pulpitis with no problem, of course. Anesthetic will uh, wear off, uh, you know, in 45 minutes. So you have to explain to the patient that may need extra anesthetic later on. Um, I'm a big fan of Stanley Malamed too. He was on episode 971, and the thing I love, so my my biggest idols like um, um, Walt Disney. He actually lived above the fire station in Disneyland. Right wow. now, the the favorite guy in finance that I love to listen to is uh, Jamie Dimon, who I've had the honor to have dinner with three times. He lives wow. on the top floor of that bank. I mean, when he hmm. was working at, when he was working at, um, um, he cut his teeth on uh, um, Citibank. And uh, City, it was Citibank, then it turned into Citigroup. And, uh, and uh, he didn't even have a car then. He said, I, I, don't, have a, I don't have time for a car. He said, right. you know, just, I just want to jump in a taxi. And if I ever make it big, I'm going to get a, an office big enough where my bedroom could be there. And 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 Stanley Malamed, he was well, he was on his honeymoon, right? Or, or not honeymoon? Uh, uh, anniversary. He was on his anniversary in Las Vegas, and he snuck back into the hotel room. I don't think he even wanted to let his wife know uh, he was going to do a podcast with me for an hour. I mean, oh the, my god, this is a guy that could probably. Yeah, he's talk incredible. About well, he, could, he, he loves it so much he can talk about it in his sleep. But when, no, it was, it was his birthday. It was definitely his birthday. And uh, my gosh, I was, I was like, okay, it's your birthday. And what do you want to do? You want to talk about dental anesthesiology. Right, right. You know, it, it just, I just yes. love passion. Um, I yeah, love he's incredible. No, yeah, no question um, about that. I also, speaking about, you know, it takes a lifetime uh, building your reputation and five minutes to ruin it. Um, the next one be broken file. I still see people paranoid about endo because of broken files because back in the day they would break. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, the first 10 years that I uh, practice, I mean, everybody routinely had files break, but they, they stopped breaking a long time ago. I mean, I can't, did, did, what, what do you think about file separation? Like that, that's the first thing on your website you're talking about a separated yes. file, but you've, yes. been doing, you've been doing root canals for almost 25 years do you, do you see file breaking and separation kind of a uh yes it gone? is still it is not really it is still a concern and uh, we have to uh, follow the uh, protocols and guidelines recommended by the uh, you know the endodontists and the um, file manufacturers of using the files just uh, once I have seen that the reciprocating systems, they uh, separate less as compared to the sum of the rotaries. Some of the rotor rotaries may separate less one when you compare to the other because there are so many designs and, uh, you know, and, uh, kinds of uh, rotary systems. But uh, one of my dreams in the future is to try to find the ideal alloy for the uh, dental file, uh, one alloy that is flexible enough for negotiating the curves canals and a uh, strong enough to, uh, you know, prevent uh, file separation. As you know, I am very busy right now. I don't have time to, you know, look into this anymore. Uh, yeah. But believe it or not, my first very, you know, my very first area of expertise in 1995, uh, we did the first ever analysis of the endodontic file. I am talking about the stainless steel one. So believe it or not, 
was that the, was that the one by Barry Musicant? Uh, well, actually, the uh, the analysis that we did it was the first uh, analysis ever. I did that in uh, Venezuela, and uh, believe it or not, uh, before that, we didn't know what kind of stainless steel we were using. Can you believe it? And I, I guess if you don't know what you're using, it's very hard to know the properties and understanding what kind uh, kind of instruments you are using. But uh, you know, then the nickel titanium came in with a uh, Dr. Wallias and the Brantley. Uh, study and then you know uh, uh, endodontists became really expert in uh, alloys, mostly uh, towards the nickel titanium uh, part. So, but yes, I believe that the separation is still there, and uh, we should do something about about it. Are you familiar with Barry, the endodontist Barry uh, Musicant with the essential yes. metal systems? I mean, the, his entire company is built on the alternative to nickel titanium and going around and round and reciprocating stainless steel. Are you a fan right. or do, do you think that that's involves merit? I mean, if well, separation is still an issue. I think that we can do better than stainless steel and nickel titanium. We should try to find something better than that. So the what journey- I don't know yet, I really, you know, yeah. I wish to have the time to look into that and, you know, but, yeah. Um, yeah. So what um, what what else do you think? You, you talked about you know that these kids are afraid of modal endo because they can't get anesthetic, and you talked about that. Um, we talked about files. Um, what percent? You know, I, I'm reading that after you get done cleaning and shaping, you're probably only removing fifty percent mechanically. Is that about what you believe? Do you think it's fifty fifty, or do you think it's sixty forty? How much do you think we're removing yes. mechanically? Well, you know, it has to be a combination. Uh, it should be chemical, mechanical, or, you know, biomechanical removal. And sodium hypochlorite so far is the best that we have. Now we are using it in combination with a, um, uh, this uh, calant, uh, um, uh, you know, solutions. And, um, yep, some uh, times we use a chlorexidine. We try not to mix chlorexidine with the sodium hypochlorite because it becomes uh, like a precipitate that is not, you know, good. But so far, this is what we have. I, maybe in the future something else will come. I don't know yet, but yes, uh, mechanically, mechanical by itself, I believe that doesn't work. And a, um, a, a chemical by itself. Doesn't there is a new system now for irrigation that uh, it you know makes sure that there is not a, uh, any bubble of air remaining there and all the sodium hypochlorite goes everywhere and that seems to help a lot but yep so far that's what we have and what we are advocating not sure if there is something else is there anything else uh, out there that well I I, I think that it's um. I don't know, maybe 50-50. I mean, you can auger out, clean and shape half of all those little fins and canals and all the right. extra stuff that the, the irrigation is what's going to get the other half. And it seems right. like, it seems like I don't know if it's because the final x-ray is what you're sending to the x-ray or the final x-ray is the only thing that one million attorneys in the United States can see, but it seems like they're so obsessed with radiographic artistic beauty i mean they want to get it to the end they want it to look beautiful on an x-ray and it can look beautiful on x-ray and just be filled with every microorganism fungi bacteria and virus known to man yeah and And, the biofilm and the biofilm right so um is there any um any air do you think the irrigation um um adjutants you know mechanical yeah it's one with the ultrasonics that that's the one which seems to go everywhere so which what what brand name do you like i i i don't like to you know i prefer not to give brands on that but yes there are some with you know ultrasound that you can use some they seem to be really effective what, what about lasers? When I, what I can tell you is that the uh, best uh, irrigation protocol that I, I know is the uh, um, uh, Hasapal uh, 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 protocol. He's the one who combines the, which, the, the sodium hypochlorite. What's his name? Hapasalo. Uh, 
uh, have passado. He is the one who proposes combining the uh, um, uh, sodium hypochlorite with the calant. And then you uh, have a very uh, a good irrigation. Also, he is involved with uh, one of the um, uh, these uh, ultrasonic uh, irrigation systems that I prefer not to say the names, but, you know, well, that's the best one. Can, would you mind one. posting his protocol yes, the in, lasers. The comment, in the comment after your Sure, article? sure. Right. I, I'd yeah, really appreciate No problem. That. Uh, Thank you. That. Sure. Then uh, regarding to lasers, uh, you know, at Temple University, we have done lots of research uh, regarding to lasers. Uh, it would be ideal to have a laser which uh, can kill bacteria, but is not melting the dentin, and also is not causing damage to the PDL because of the heat that it causes. Not sure how the lasers are, you know, now how how, uh, yeah, how um, uh, near to that goal the lasers are, because I have I haven't looked into lasers recently. But, you know, if you ask me what the ideal laser would be, it would be the laser that can kill uh, bacteria, doesn't melt the dentin, and uh, doesn't damage the PDL because of the heat. Well, the lasers, what's neat about them is they don't have to be perfect at all because boys just love toys, and my God, you only have to right, right. barely twist the dentist's pinky, and he'll buy a laser for periamplantitis or a laser to cut teeth. I mean, they, they just... Love lasers. Right. I, I'm all for it if that's what flips your flipper and puts a smile on your face and makes you want to go play dentistry. But if you're coming back to me exactly. and you're telling me that you have to have this for therapeutic protocol or return on investment, then I tell you that you need to go get therapy uh, starting with your CPA. Uh, but but if they right. burn but if they burn out, that costs them millions. I mean, I can I, I'm. A, I don't know whether. To, exactly. I, I mean, I almost want to cry when I hear a 40-year-old dentist telling me he hopes he can retire in five in, in by, before he's 50. And I'm like, dude, 50. Fix, fix why you're. Fix why you want to quit. Don't, don't 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 sit there at right. 40 and say I only got 10 more years. That that's not the answer. The answer is why do you want to quit today? Go solve that. So, sometimes it's just in their head. Sometimes they need to see a therapist. Sometimes they need medication. Right. Sometimes they need a divorce. Sometimes they, you know, but just fix why you're miserable, you know. Um, right. And uh, I, I remember 25% of, the, of our listeners are still in dental school. Um, a very common problem they have is they obviously know it's coming from the lower right, but they're not 100% sure if it's one molar or the other. Any any low hanging fruit tips when they just can't decide if it's one tooth or the other? Yes, the best the uh, best way to find out is to uh, use a very consistent a uh, pulp vitality testing protocol. The first thing they should do is to ask the patient where they do believe is the pain is coming from. Sometimes they just, you know, show you with the finger or with the, with the tongue. Then the first test that they should do is percussion because that's a very useful test. And sometimes it just tells you what is going on. So percussion first, then uh, they should do a, a tooth sleuth, which is uh, asking to the patient to bite down on the bite stick tooth by tooth until the patient feels something. And finally, the most important test of all is the endo eyes because that one will give you the uh, where or not the tooth is necrotic or if there is any lingering pain. The best way to do the endo eyes test is not with the Q-tip because I have seen a dentist doing this with the Q-tip all the time. The problem with the Q-tip is that the Q-tip has like a wood stick and when you apply the cold, the wood will absorb all the cold and isolate it. And then at the time you put it there, it doesn't, you know, the cotton is not cold anymore. Yes, he, he, you were asking me about uh, how to identify um, uh, the, which one the problem tooth is when the patient is pointing to the lower right. So I was uh, saying, I am not in what part the um, uh, communication drop, but uh, I was saying that the uh, first thing that I like to do is uh, asking to the patient where he or she believes the pain is coming from. Sometimes they show you with the finger, sometimes 
they show you with the uh, tongue. So then the first test that I like to do is the um, uh, percussion. That test is very helpful. Sometimes it tells you, uh, uh, gives you a lot of information. Then I like to do the uh, tooth sleuth uh, because sometimes the pain could be coming from a crack on the tooth. And that pain is, uh, that uh, test is very useful for detecting the, what we call the crack tooth uh, syndrome. Then the third test that I uh, recommend to do is the endo ice in that order. Percussion first, a tooth sleuth, a second endo ice, third. Because the endo, eye, endo ice will give you a, the a pulp uh, vitality status. You can tell whether or not it is necronic or vital or lingering, which means uh, symptomatic uh, pulpitis. And a, uh, there is another test that sometimes we use when we are not sure, which is the EPT, the electronic pulp tester. That one uh, helps uh, also a lot. When doing the endo eyes, I always recommend to uh, you know the students and to other dentists to do it with, uh, not to do it with the Q-tip. Because uh, when you spray into the Q-tip, the cold is absorbed by the wood. And then was, at, at the time you put it on the tooth, it is not cold enough. So what we do is we uh, prepare a small AM, uh, like cotton ball, and then we take it with the cotton uh, plier or the cotton forceps. We spray the cotton forceps, and then that uh, cotton pellet is in the cold enough for uh, making or not, uh, you know, the, the patient uh, having a response to the call. Of course, all these should be complemented with uh, x-rays. Sometimes you can tell, uh, you know, the x-rays complement all this information. And also I like to do a perioprobing, uh, because sometimes the problem is coming from cracks, as I mentioned before, and palpation. Palpation is very helpful. And we always uh, should look for uh, possible uh, fistulas or any other uh, kind of lesions, uh, intraoral, extraoral swelling as well. So if you do, do all this together, you will have a very accurate diagnosis, diagnosis skills, and then you, know, you will be very confident finding out what the problem tooth is. You promised me an hour of your life, and I already went over the hour, but can I just ask two more questions? Sure. It's dentistry uncensored, so I don't like to talk about anything everyone agrees on. i got two final questions. Um, um, the first one will be pain meds. The second will be uh, antibiotics. Um, to put a little historical perspective, when I got out of school 30 years ago, the doctors were the bad guys because all these people were in pain and the doctors wouldn't give them pain meds, especially with cancer patients. They're like, look, grandma's going to die anyway. Why don't you, I don't care if you have to give her heroin or opium or I don't care what it is. Now, 30 years later, now we're the bad guy because we, they say we overprescribe way too much. And hydrocodone has been the number one prescribed uh, pill at a pharmacy for over a decade. Um, what percent, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire, what percent of your patients as an endodontist are you giving opioids, narcotics like Vicodin at the end of the appointment? Actually, now, because of right. the, all this opioids crisis and all these problems and the new protocols, I am doing just 1% because 1%. they request or because, you know, uh, yes, because they say that they have allergies to the other medications because they say that they, their stomach, they can tolerate. Sometimes they are addicts and they just are requesting, who knows? But I try to, you know, I minimize that a lot because I, I explain them that due to all this crisis, now we have a new protocol, which is giving together the uh, ibuprofen, 600 or 800 milligrams, together with Tylenol like 500 or 650 milligrams. So I explain them that if they take both at the same time, that works incredibly for pain, and they believe me. So Tylenol, so so only, ibuprofen, mm -hmm. 600 milligram, and Tylenol, how much? How much Tylenol? Uh, the uh, the, uh, the um, uh, 650, if you want to do it every eight hours. If so you want to ibuprofen, do it every six hours. Okay, ibuprofen, 600. Combined with Tylenol 650 every eight hours. Uh, 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 ibuprofen 800, Tylenol 650 every eight. 
Every and if you do the um, uh, yes, if you you know maybe have a yeah, like a younger patient or the body weight is not you know uh, it's not enough for giving these uh, yeah, high doses uh, dosages, then you can do 600 ibuprofen, 500 Tylenol, uh, Tylenol every six hours. So, okay. final question: um, antibodies, um, antibiotics. I mean, I know. I mean, you would not believe how many dentists, after every single molar endo they do, give them you know pen VK. And they say it's CYA, cover my ass, it helps. What, what, what percent of your molar endos that you do, do you give them antibiotics at the end of the procedure? Well, as we review previously, these diagnostic tests, I, as you can imagine, I do it on every patient before starting or before prescribing. So if I found out that the tooth diagnosis is necrosis or you know necrotic pulp or towards necrosis or acute apical periodontitis, then I consider the a antibiotics prescription. Also, of course, if there is a fistula or if the patient is swollen. If I diagnose a irreversible pulpitis, I am not prescribing antibiotics. So I just prescribe antibiotics on cases of necrotic pulp. When I think they need antibiotics for those reasons, and they say, well, I don't want to take antibiotics because they're not natural, you know what I say? I say, why don't ants ever get sick? Because they have antibodies. Right. <laughs> Is that the worst <laughs> joke you've ever heard? Um, but, uh, no, it's a good one. I would start saying it to my patients, though. But anyway, hey, um, I just can't believe I got you to come on the show. It's just a huge honor. Uh, I'm sure my homies learned Same so much. You know, I learned a lot. Uh, thank you so much for reading that article. And let me tell you something about these articles, kids, that, you know, one-way media just doesn't work for you. If, if you read an article and you have a question, that's why I love mo – that's why we love Dentaltown because you can read his article on Dentaltown. And if you don't get it, just ask a question. And, um, and you know, don't be afraid to ask a question. Um, I know in, um, after lecturing a thousand times that you say before the break, does anybody have any questions? No questions. Okay, let's take a 15-minute break. And then 20 people rush up to you because they want to ask right, their right. private, personal question that every single other person on the planet has. I mean, there's nothing unique about anybody. I don't care if your name's unique. You're not. Uh, so when you read these articles, um, have the courage to raise your hand and post. And if you disagree, just because you're young, um, I don't care if you're in dental school. If you sat there and said, I, I completely disagree, neither of us are going to go home and cry. Um, so, you know, it's just, right. you know, you have to be, uh, I, we love the passion. We love the challenge. Ask your questions. If this on YouTube, comment on the YouTube deal. And by the way, you should not be watching this show on, uh, listening to this on iTunes. You got two gorgeous bald men, so you should switch over to YouTube, uh, for this one. But Hey, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope you have a rocking hot day. Thank you. Thank you very much. And pleasure meeting you. Um, guys get the norm. Now you know how to do it. Thanks.